first of all, thank you so much to the Swan Dancers for being here tonight. What a, an honor to have them here. Lily Jackson, Doug War Eagle, and Floyd Clown Tanklings tonight. I told you I was terrible at introductions. It's a given. I will stumble on a name. Uh, it is just absolutely our delight to have these gentlemen here tonight. After seeing their family's name and story misrepresented in popular culture and in the history books, uh, these gentlemen set out to set the story straight. They were called to set the story straight. And their labor of love for their family has become their gift to the rest of us in the form of the book Crazy Horse. Lakota Warriors Life and Legacy, in which they've drawn from their family's oral history and uh, the legal documents to create a, an accurate representation of Crazy Horse's life. And they have brought the truth to light and that is their gift to us and to future generations and for that we are grateful. So please, without further ado, join me in welcoming Doug War Eagle, Floyd Clown, and William Matson Tinkling. We want to thank everybody for uh, for coming out. This is a uh, a good uh, a good turnout, I have to say. <laughs> um, my name is William Matson. This is Floyd Clown and Doug War Eagle. Um, this is our 83rd book signing. Um, and uh, at the first 82, we had the same question uh, that was asked. So I'm going to get that out of the way right now. How did I uh, come to become uh, hooked up with the Crazy Horse family? Uh, that happened before I was born. My dad was in the 7th Cavalry during World War II. And uh, during basic training, they used to ask who won the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And he said that the Indians did. And that was the wrong answer, and he was punished for it. And um, I don't know exactly what the punishment was, but I heard it a lot as a kid. And apparently he held a grudge that he uh, passed along to his son. He wanted to write, his, uh, uh, write a book on the native side of the battle. Um, but life got in the way, and um, tried, he's making a living and, and raising a family. And uh, he started doing it near the end of his life, but he got lymphoma. And he, on his deathbed, he asked me to do it. Well, at the time, it wasn't it wasn't really my deal; it was my dad's deal. But you can't say no, and so I said yes. And um, uh, so after he passed, I. I uh, I looked at what he had and, and, and everything that was out there, and there weren't really any native voices uh, in, in almost all the writing. And a lot of it had, people would have a theory and then somebody else would take that theory and put it in another book and make it, put it in their bibliography and now it's a fact. And so it got all mixed up. So uh, this was 1998, and this is uh, uh, when uh, I look, went on the internet and this is about the time when uh, there was dial-up that worked sometimes. And um, uh, I found somebody out on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. And so I called him. His name was Eugene's Little Coyote. Um, because finding somebody in, in, during that period in 1998 was, was difficult to have an email address. So um, uh, I called him and uh, I asked him, do you... Do you or your family have any uh, uh, stories of the Battle of Little Bighorn? He said, yeah. So um, I said, can I come out and get them from you? Yeah. So I flew out from Portland, Oregon to Billings. I drove out to uh, Dull Knife College. And I don't think he thought I was, uh, I, he thought that I was going to come. Um, because I showed up and, and I said, I'm the guy from Portland, Oregon that was looking for the stories. Uh, of the Battle of Little Bighorn. You got, you got him? He said, no. <laughs> and um, I said, do you know anybody that does? 
He said, follow me. And he took me into the Dull Knife College Library and said, read these. And so that was uh, kind of my introduction. <laughs> um, so I did. I read, I read all, all the stories, or all, all the books that, that he was talking about, um, about 300, and they didn't make sense. They didn't come together. Um, so uh, in 2001, uh, I found somebody else on the internet, uh, and I, it was at Cheyenne River. So I, I called him, and, and uh, I, at the time I became interested in Crazy Horse, and I, I'm a documentary filmmaker, and, and a documentary filmmaker is nothing more than, than somebody that can't afford to make a feature film. <laughs> um, and so uh, I, I, I called him up, and, and um, uh, I needed the, I, I told him I'd, I'd like to have the, I'd like to know the, the names of the, of the mothers that raised Crazy Horse, because none of the books had it. And um, he said he might know who they are. So oh, that, that's all it took. And I, I got on an airplane and went out to uh, uh, Rapid City and, and went to uh, Cheyenne River, and he stood me up. And so I had three days there, and I had only been studying the historical side. I hadn't been studying the spiritual. I hadn't been studying the cultural. And so uh, I had three days, and I thought, well, I'm going to go out to the Sacred Mountain Bear Butte, and um, I'm going to I'm going to see uh, what that's all about. And being a typical white guy, all the spirituality happens at the top, right? Well, halfway up, my my dad spoke to me, and he said, "Open your heart." And I, I knew what that meant. It meant I needed to know the spiritual side and the cultural side of uh, of the uh, Lakota people. And so uh, I went back and. I read all the books on it, on it, and um, each one had a ceremony in it. And each one said, "This is the only way," and they were all different. So I, I went back out to uh, Bear Butte, and I met uh, a Jim Jandro, who was the head ranger there, and he's a Dakota. And I was explaining to him that I'd like to know about the more like, about the Lakota, and also uh, Crazy Horse's moms. And he said, "I got something for you." And he gave me Doug's number, and so. Uh, I called Doug and uh, went out there and they said, um, we we're expecting you. We knew you were coming from the West. I thought, gee, that's kind of a line out of a movie. <laughs> and so um, so uh, I had my script with me. I gave it to Floyd and he read three words and he said, this is garbage. I threw it down on the table. And I pretended like it wasn't hurt. <laughs> and. Um, and they said they would tell the uh, the true story, the truth about Crazy Horse, if I had a good heart. Mm -hmm. And so I was sitting there wondering, how do I show that I have a good heart? Um, you know, and I had an airplane ticket to go home, so I only had a limited amount of time. And they said, well, we, we'd like like uh, you to go in the sweat. I thought, oh, I, I read about that. Uh, I was I was excited, and uh, when he's building the fire. Um, they were bringing the wood. I started helping bring the wood. And pretty soon I was sprinting to bring the wood. And everybody was standing back watching me because I was sprinting. I guess I was a little over the top. And I can remember their uncle saying, this guy kind of scares me. <laughs> so um, so he went in the, in the sweat lodge. And they all they sang in Lakota. They, they prayed in Lakota. I was the only one in English. And then um, afterwards, and it was a great experience. It's a great experience. And, and afterwards, I, I, uh, I was wondering how my heart did, and nobody said anything. The silence was deafening. And um, we went inside, and we, we were eating, and, and finally I said, I wish I knew your language. I, I would have sang with you. And um, the firekeeper, who had stayed on the outside and never went in, and just brought the rocks in and everything, he said, well, um, they don't let me in there because I sing Merle Haggard. <laughs> and, and at that point, I realized that I, I had been accepted. Um, and, and we went out and uh, uh, filmed uh, a lot of the sites over the next decade. Uh, they have landmarks uh, from their oral history. Um, and, uh, and it took that long because, you know, they weren't all just off the freeway. And um, it was a great experience uh, working with them. Um, they know their genealogy uh, very well, extremely well. 
In fact, I was kind of embarrassed about my own genealogy. Um, but they had everything documented. And so uh, being embarrassed, I, I decided I'd, I'd learn mine. And I found a family out in Sweden that, that we were related to that my parents didn't even know. So um, there was, uh, and also Norway and, and England. So um, it was, that was extremely you know, positive. Uh, we have a Facebook site, and uh, on this Facebook site, there's a lot of people that go on there and say, gee, I, I, I wish uh, this had been taught in schools. How come, how come we don't teach this? How come uh, uh, we, we have this other history that, that really isn't true? And um, uh, my mom was on the school board for 39 years. My dad was on it two years prior. He didn't like it as much, I guess. Um, and um, uh, they passed before this got finished. But uh, had they been alive, we'd, we'd be in at least one school district. And um, I would I would encourage uh, everybody here uh, to at least have it have it in in, uh, in the schools and the library and get a hold of the school board and. Um, and uh, get get the history, the true history, into the schools, and, and educate uh, uh, the people and, and the population so that they know the truth of, of everything that happened. Um, I, I think it's important. Uh, truth is a is a healing um, is a healing thing, and and um, it's something that uh, that we all need especially in today's day and age. Um, I would say that, uh, that working with the, with the Crazy Horse family has been uh, a wonderful experience um, over the, for the past decade. I, I, my dad set me on the right course. I didn't know it at the time, but uh, it was a wonderful experience. And working with them has, has been uh, uh, just a blessing and, and an honor. And um, right now, I'd like to, to pass that along, pass the mic along to Floyd, uh, who's the eldest of the brothers, and let him say a few words. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. Um, for our family, uh, this started in 1990 when um, the Crazy Horse Estate went into a federal court case with the Hornell Brewing Company that was making Crazy Horse malt liquor. And 2001, um, that was when they, um, uh, the federal court system awarded the name and all the rights back to the family who won the case. So after that, um, um, the acting administrator for the Crazy Rush Estate, um, federal law says that to be an administrator of an estate, you have to be of blood. And this is where we knew that um, the administrator, the acting administrator, wasn't from our family. So this was when, um, 2001, was when we were told to tell our true identity who we are now. So um, this is where, um, in this federal court case, determining the blood heirs of the Crazy Horse Estate uh, um, stood up for my father, who's in front of the book, his name was Edward Clown. And he passed in uh, 1987, is when he passed, in 2001, because they used his name in this court case and like this, that I stood up for my father to correct uh, everything, uh, the truth. They told us no more assumptions. Um, so that was when, we, in this federal court case, uh, back home, everything is based on the paternal side, the father's side of the family. So this is where, um, in this federal court case, uh, we proved um, that my my father was a nephew to the warrior um, in this federal court uh, case. And the acting administrator at that time uh, said that he wasn't from that family. Uh, 
not from the father's side, it was from the mother's side. So that was when we put this, uh, the blood tree of the maternal side of Pedro's in this court case. And he wasn't on that either. So since 2001 to now, um, we're still waiting on the closing date of this court case, determining the blood heirs of the Pedro's estate. So um, this is where um, our family, um, we were uh, never told to tell who we are, our identity, up until 2001. So nobody knew our family, uh, our grandfathers, grandmothers, like this. So this is where, um, uh, when we uh, showed the blood trees on the father and mother side of this court case, um, we were told to do it with truth. And um, in federal, under the federal law, um, they recognize a, a probate, which is a death certificate. Uh, and when we researched, um, that was kept on our people. It started from 1904 and five, when they kept probates on our people. And um, before that, uh, when they put us on these agencies in 1890, um, they recognized enrollments and allotments as legal documents. And then before that was census, ration listings, and church records. These six documents are legal documents under federal law proving your identity, who you are. So this is what we used, and um, we made our blood trees for the crazy horse family. And this is what we produced in 2001 in this federal court case. So this is where um, all the tribes, bands, nations that were claiming our family and my grandfather, now it was time to show you proof what you've been claiming, what you've been assuming. Um, so uh, when we did this uh, blood trees, uh, we were told to do it with truth. And once you put the truth down, they'll never change the truth. So this is what we did, and we put the truth down. So now we've been waiting 16 years, um, and our tree is the only one in this federal court case. We could prove who we are. So uh, this is what we've been waiting on, um, on Pine Ridge and Rosebud. We've been claiming my family and my grandfather for the last 140 years. So uh, in this court case, I was made administrator for the Crazy Horse family from Cheyenne River. And um, they made administrators for Rosebud and Pine Ridge, and they were told, you need to make a blood tree like what Cheyenne River did. And they haven't done one yet, uh, up to date, to today. So we're just waiting on the closing date of this court case, um, because there, everybody was, um, I guess, caught off guard <laughs> that that the blood family was still here mm -hmm. of the, uh, our grandfather. So uh, this is where um, um, everything that um, was written about my grandfather before um, uh, we made a book for our, our, book, our blood family. 2001, when we produced these blood trees, father and mother side, there was 3,000 blood family of crazy horse. So there were 600 on the father's side and 2,400 on the mother's side. So that's who I represent in this court case. I'm the administrator for the crazy horse family. And then from the family itself, um, they appointed me and my two younger brothers as administrators for the crazy horse family to represent them and like this talk, talks or anything, that's who we speak for, it's the 3,000 blood family. So for us, uh, growing up, um, we were always taught uh, that when they talked about my grandfather, um, we were just supposed to listen and walk away, not tell who we are, until 2001. Now you could say, I'm a grandson, how are you related to me? because I could prove it in federal court under the federal law. Now show me your proof of 
you can assume it. So this is where um, it's time for truth now of our people, um, our nations. And they told us with this truth, um, these families that have been claiming our family and my grandfather, by assuming that they were of my family, they've been neglecting their grandfathers and grandmothers where they came from, their true identity, who they are, their blood rights. So this is what they're finding out. And as truth, you know, sometimes truth hurts. So this is what everybody shies away from truth because it hurts sometimes. But for our family, um, we had to keep quiet from 1877 to 2001. 124 years of our family. Um, when my grandfather was here, um, uh, when he came into Fort Robinson, um, he was assassinated by the government in his own time. But he knew that before that happened, 15 months before it happened, at the Battle of Little Bighorn, two weeks before, when they held that Sundance north of Lame Deer, Montana today, that's where um, he was shown his vision of his demise. I just gonna leave this earth. So um, there's a rock uh, north of uh, Lame Deer today, six miles north uh, on this, uh, his name is Jack Bailey on his land. And that rock, uh, they call it Deer Medicine Rock today, where our family called it the rock that belonged to the black tailed deer. And on this rock is where Sitting Bull's vision was put, what was going to happen at the Battle of Little Bighorn. And then right west of it, um, it's called Owl Rock. It looks like an owl sitting there. And that's one of our family's medicines. And um, on the belly of that owl, my grandfather put his vision of how he's going to leave this earth. So on the belly of that owl, he put um, the doctor that was uh, there, Melakuddy. And he was standing beside him, and the soldier that stabbed him twice, he even showed the marks where he got stabbed. And um, his own kind was standing with the soldiers, with his soldier. And it showed uh, horse tracks up and down coming in, meaning he was to be alive. But when he leaves, these horse tracks were laying down, meaning he was to be dead when he leaves. So he already knew that uh, 15 months before it happened at Fort Robinson, that his own kind and the government would kill him. But when he was um, told to uh, come in and like that, they promised him an agency to keep him from fighting resisting, you know, preserving and protecting our people. So uh, when they brought him, when uh, he came in, uh, the government uh, made an agency for him. And that's when he got assassinated after they put it down on paper. So um, after he got assassinated, when they brought this agency, um, that was in, uh, these two paper tribes that the government uh, made. Um, one was uh, an Oglala and one was a Sichunko. These two tribes were, were the government acknowledged these two tribes. And then they put two people in front of these two tribes, which, um, uh, and then acknowledged them because they knew they were yes people. They would never say no to the government. So this is where, um, when they brought his agency, um, these two signed for my grandfather's agency. Because they said, we're the ones that the government recognizes and we represent the people. But when they signed it, um, his agency, the United States said that was a legal transaction, that only the blood family could claim this agency. And that's where the uh, United States made the act of 1877 in the United States history, where the United States confiscated 8.7 million acres, including the Black Hills. That's my grandfather's agency. 
So this is what um, this federal court case that we're in, waiting for the closing date. Once we're uh, le uh, legally recognized under the federal government as a blood family, then we want my grandfather's agency. And um, 2007, um, one of the uh, when. When we told our identity in this federal court case, we were invited up to uh, Little Bighorn Battlefield. But they were dedicating an Indian memorial up there in 2003 that was honoring all the Lakota and the fans that fell at this battle. And uh, so when we went up there, and that was when we told the, all the tribes who we are, that. Uh, we're grandsons of crazy horse, and my grandfather was Nikoj. That's what he is. So um, his mother and mother and father of Nikoj, that makes him Nikoj. So that's what we are, our, our family. So um, that was when um, when we told our identity up there. Um, they invited us there, and uh, they. Um, asked us how the Lakota did that battle. Because nobody knew of this battle because the Lakota nation hit the story of this battle with our family. So they said there was 300, oh, 3,000, 3,000 books written about the Battle of Little Bighorn. And not one from the Lakota nation who the United States declared war on. So um, this is when we told them the truth of how our grandfather did this. And at that time, the superintendents, the three former superintendents and like that, um, they um, they were present with their historians and curators and like that. And their historian was sitting with um, a soldier's uh, journal. Back in 1876, all the soldiers carried a journal. They, they were writing down in their, these journals what they were seeing and what they were experiencing. So this is what this historian was sitting with when we told how our grandfathers did this battle. And at that time, um, when we told it, it matched up to everything that they had that was recorded by the soldiers. So they knew that we were telling the truth because it matched up to their or what they put in the journals that they're all carrying. So this is where um, uh, the historian up there, uh, I think it was 1984, uh, was a fire that came through the Battle of uh, uh, Little Bighorn Battlefield and burnt 600 of the 640 acres of this battlefield. And when they did that, um, they found that uh, there was a lot of rocks around Last Stand Hill. And there were river rocks that, uh, so they checked their uh, geographic maps and and they found that uh, that area was supposed to have no rocks in that area. So that was when we told them those were uh, corns, what they called their markers. So this is the only battle that our people and the Cheyennes uh, after that battle, when they removed their uh, their dead, uh, their relatives, they marked it with a river rock. So at that time, um, uh, when we told them the truth of this battle, we were given permission to walk out on this battlefield and mark all these rocks uh, with the markers of our Lakota and and at that time, we marked 215 that fell. And we were missing, what, 35? I think 35, 26 more. So uh, that was when the, um, the his historian there said, um, cause at that time, um, I think it's on the untold story of the little big one. They found two, two uh, skeletons of soldiers at that time. and. The historian said that there were still 26 soldiers unaccounted for. So we took them down to 
deep ravine and we showed him where there was nine buried. So he was checking his his um, records and stuff and he said we checked this whole area at already before. And then when he was checking his records, he found that, because they had machines that would uh, go under the ground and like this. He found that um, all that time they were set up right on top of that line that were buried there. And they scanned all the way around them. That's why they never found them. So we showed them where they were and then it was verified. And then there were 17 on uh, Sharpshooter Ridge of the soldiers that were buried there. So that was when we told them, now you have all your soldiers accounted for, now it's our turn. And that's when these red markers start going up up there at the, uh, the battlefield. So it was, uh, time for truth now they, they and them, uh, when they dedicated this Indian memorial, it was peace, uh, unified through peace or peace to unity, right? like that uh, thing that they, they pushed. But this is where um, our grandfather that was promised an agency, um, we met this uh, man that, um, his name was William Carrington. And 2007, he came and uh, he asked us if he could go look for my grandfather's agency, because he heard us say that. And uh, he said, I live uh, one hour from Washington, D.C., um, in North Carolina. So go ahead, go look. You know. And there he called back and he said, I, he went, I went to the Smithsonian and I went to the American Library of Congress and, and I didn't find it anywhere. So that was when uh, I knew that he was looking. I told my brothers that I wanted to make sure he, he wasn't just saying that. But um, this is where, um, uh, because he's a historian, um, historians have a bit, uh, access to the original documents that they research, more than what we could get as citizens. And um, this is where, um, uh, when he looked, what we told him, uh, is sitting in the Secretary of State office. So that's where he went, and he said they let him downstairs because he called us back after that and told us that they let him downstairs and uh, to security, and they let him down the hall and into a room where, in the middle of this room, was a table with glass over the top of it, and it had Crazy Agency docket numbers, land description, presidential seal on it. So under the federal law, when the president puts a presidential seal on something and that seal is not broke is still law today. So uh, he said, I remember you said that so I walked around the table and I inspected it and that seal is not broke. So uh, it's still sitting in, in uh, Secretary of State office. So uh, we told him, our grandfathers don't lie to us. They're the ones that told us that sitting over there. So this is where, um, under the federal law, uh, we're going to test the government. These man-made laws that they make and what we live by. <coughs> and then um, this, our grandfather's agency, um, there's 119 families that are entitled to this agency. So federal law says uh, trust status lands is not taxable and a non-Indian can own it, sell it, live on it, or trade it. So this is what we want our grandfather's agency to trust the status lands. And these are uh, federal laws that we live by. So um, we're going to see how truthful and honest they are uh, of our, uh, what they make like this. But, um, when we were in hiding, um, when the government found out in 1890 um, that our grandfather spotted out who the government knew as uh, Bigfoot, when they found out 
uh, that that was crazy was his cousin. That's when wounded knee happened. When they unarmed our people and women, children, elders, and massacred them. And the United States called it a battle. And they gave out 27 Congressional Medal of Honors for doing that. So these kind of stuff uh, we, we want to correct, because that was a massacre. Where um, uh, Groton, where today Groton and Fetterman massacres, those were battles. Because they were soldiers, they had artillery, they had rifles, sabers, pistols, and they all got wiped out, and they called them massacres. United States. So these kind of things uh, we want to correct now. For our people. So um, when that happened, then um, World War One. My dad's oldest brother went. To